So here, in our approach, we look at the dam or a group of dams as a complex system. So the based on, for example, the scale of influence, so it can be within the river reach or even in the catchment scale of basin, interbasin, or even transboundary, as we know. And of course, the purpose is of these dams, and because most of the dams, particularly in, if you look at in India or in our subcontinent, there are various stakeholders with different goals and interests. And um, another important thing is impacts. So it has different kind of impacts, like social, economic, environmental, as well as the cascade effects that we talk about. But when we talk about for the existing dams and talk about the dam rehabilitation and improvement, it should be taken as a sustainability measures. So that can be structural, non-structural or recurrent. For example, the institution is strengthening the regulations, leg legislations, as well as knowledge base, establishment of think tanks, all these are uh, sustainability measures, in fact. So, talking about the tools, so, so what is the aim of uh, the tool that we name as uh, Dam Resilience and Sustainability Assessment Framework and Tool? So, our aim is to develop a state-of-the-art framework which is complemented with a visual and perceptive interactive tool coupled with simple as well as uh, sophisticated models and software. So, if I look at the objectives, it's mainly start with the exploring, screening, and prioritizing rehabilitation and improvement efforts, assessing rehabilitation and uh, improvement efforts in view of sustainability measures, as I have just mentioned, and quantifying the associated processes and impacts, assisting stakeholders, policymakers, and professionals during communication, discussion, analysis, prioritization and decision-making processes. Facilitating the interlinkage between the knowledge, science, practice, and policy and decision-making processes. So basically, this is the science, the communication between the science and the policy. So the, the aim is, so the, our aim is to develop it in a different component, starting from a simple to a complex so now we are in the stage of uh, review and preparation of the knowledge base for the tool. So basically if I divide it in the components, the first component will be a gaming tool, which will be aimed at uh, training, communication, and awareness purpose. The second com uh, component will be the tool with the more elaborated framework for a sustainability assessment. So we can do uh, maybe decouple away the impact assessment and process assessment so that you can assess the sustainability of your interventions. And uh, component three is, of course, the most challenging and very ambitious, is coupling them with the different relevant tools and software, for example, for process and impact assessment, for operation and optimization, for decision support system, and so on. So this uh, will be definitely, uh, obviously, developed in phases. Uh, just to give you an example, so of course it's not from, uh, the things is not from scratch. So there are already existing uh, uh, tools and approach which we want to complement with and integrate. For example, a serious games tool, which has been developed for, uh, uh, in, in deltas and by other organizations. For example, for sustainable delta, for port of future, and SIM basin. So SIM basin is basically for the basin management, which can be very much applicable to our case as well. So it's basically the first component is basically a gaming, which includes maps, yeah, playing cards, softwares. So it's more in a, how to say, or with, a, uh, with a visualization, it's a clear visualization. So to get uh, some other examples, for example, uh, hydropower sustainability assessment protocol, which is, uh, uh, developed by International Hydropower Association, which is a simple protocol uh, and only limited to hydropower. Uh, there is, of course, no process assessment and they do not quantify the impact. So they just, they just assess uh, uh, this, uh, 
sustainability in a very simple way. No coupled approach for adaptation and mitigation uh, measures, of course. And the tool we are proposing, the Dam Resilience and Sustainability Assessment Tool, has an interface with this uh, hydropower sustainability assessment to, uh, protocol as well, but also applicable to the multi-purpose projects, which is very important, I think, we, we think. And this includes the assessment of relevant processes and impacts on people, planet, and prosperity, so basically uh, the triple bottom criteria. And uh, the tool proposes the adaptation and sustainability measures and assess their effectiveness and impacts. And another tool, uh, the, another example that we are complementing with is a circle tool. It is developed at Deltaras with our organization. And uh, uh, this tool is usually used to explore the multi-sectoral relation as well as uh, direct and cascading effects of uh, dam projects. So these are the tools basically the complemented with uh, the approach that we have been talking about. So if we talk about su sustainability, so it's in the criteria, we are clear about criteria, what are the criteria and the actions. I already showed you already uh, the components of our tool, which is basically based on, on these uh, steps, actions. So I'm not going to explain this too much because I don't have much time. Okay. Uh, so we list, we outline the, 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 the function of the dams and the relevant processes, associate impacts and external th threats. This can be this and it can, of course, there can be uh, uh, more, uh, but this all, of course, depends. And then we select, we select the relevant ones. So this is an example. So, and this, this will be, of course, depends on the, on the situation in the particular situation, basins, or even regions, or even country. And we also hear, for example, uh, an outline the uh, rehabilitation measures. So what could be the uh, for possible measures, structural and non-structural, and the recurrent. So what we have to think of is that sustainability criteria that associated with measures and priority shall also consider social, cultural, and economical setup of the region or country and cannot be imposed in the same way everywhere. So we have to consider this while uh, developing our tools. So, so far uh, as uh, the non-structural measures are considered, I can give you some examples about uh, the recent technology and knowledge which we can use. For example, advanced monitoring. And these are the tools they can be as a process and for the process and impact assessment. At the same time, these are the non-structural sustainability measures. You have uh, advanced imagery technique, advanced processing, because these images have a huge amount of, uh, yeah, uh, you need a huge amount of resources, uh, but there are new and smart techniques where you can do it in an efficient way. And we have a way to like model uh, physical and numerical modeling. So all these are in one hand for the process and impact assessment. What? Ice occurs. And this is the side view of the same. And this is the hot water heating arrangement. You can see the two unit of hot water generator circulating the hot water through with the help of pumps in the red, red pipes and the it covers all the skin plate and embedded parts and then come back again to the outwater generator and works in the closed loop. This is the heating arrangement provided over in the downstream of the gates for the to handle the downstream ice and this is a typical design value for one of the gates or calculated on the basis of area for one of our Kisanganga IC project. And this is the photograph showing the gate with the heating pipe arrangements and the box. And the last one is the introduction of hydraulic motor operated drop down moisturing system. Uh, this is requirement, this requirement is only, uh, we have provided this for the search soft gates. One of the search soft gate fails and we faces the generation loss. So we are providing hydraulic motor operated hoisting arrangement for this system to overcome the problem of gate hosting system failure.
and these are the addition and deletion of the uh, components uh, hydraulic motor motors is modified slab splint sap hydraulic power pack hydraulic piping and the microprocessor based control panel hydraulic brake in place all the conventional uh, components and these are the benefits of the hydraulic motor operated hoisting system in comparison to electromechanical system a smooth operation and fulfillment of various speed requirement we can achieve high speed up to 4 meter per minute for the gates in comparison to electromechanical system as 0.5 to 1 meter gate can be operated from remote location also you can operate the gates from power house also especially for the such soft gate and the, the all, all the power is transmitted through hydraulic oil only we can install separate brake we call it parking brake as an additional safety following the gate during the travel and this is a photograph showing the hydraulic motor installed one of the radio one of the gate and this is the total system along with the power pack unit and this is the section showing the operation of hydraulic motor along with this principle how to it operates and the, it is the retro fitting proposal for one officer sort of on trial basis for our bhaliganga power station and thank you uh, thank you very much uh, now i invite uh, mr t kuneda okay uh, director japan water agency you would be talking on visual inspection of anchor work site with a small size multi copter oh, okay thank you mr chairman uh distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen uh good morning i'm tatsuo kunieda from japan water agency uh it's my great honor to have this opportunity and japan water agency is a uh, an administrative agency which is implementing and materializing the uh, national policies on the ground in the case of jwa we are mandated to develop and manage water resources in seven major river basins in japan according to the law uh, jwa has been uh, constructing and managing a variety of dams and barrages and canals so as you may know well uh, japan has been developing many so many uh, infrastructures after the world war 2 So currently the maintenance and uh, rehabilitation work of this aging infrastructure is uh, one of the nationwide challenges uh, in Japan. So by doing appropriate and uh, periodical inspection and giving required maintenance the life of infra infrastructure is expected to be prolonged. Having said that it is normally very hard to inspect a uh, whole structure in a certain time due to the, its huge scale so additionally the structure is not designed considering the maintenance and the rehabilitation work in general partially yes uh, gates on a dam uh, equips catwalks for daily operation and maintenance however the most of concrete structure does not have such a scaffold In order to ease this issue, the utilizing the drone, multicopter, I use several terminology. Multicopter, UAV, and drone is the same meaning. A drone is used in many places recently. Even in the infrastructure inspection field, uh, using drone is becoming very popular in Japan. By combining with artificial intelligence or uh, other image recognition technologies, our inspection work could be done with less efforts jwa is now trying to find out how to use a drone uh, effectively for many types of inspection work in collaboration with private sectors and uh, academia before going to the main subject i want to show some examples using a uh, drone in jwa uh, by taking photo from a drone in combination with 3d scanner 
and uh, overlaying on the electronic drawings, we can easily develop the, such a three-dimensional uh, virtual model. And also using uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which can extract cracks from the photo, this kind of crack map can be developed. On this map, uh, not only cracks, but also free line uh, leakage and other deterioration are presented. Uh, sometimes this kind of map can suggest uh, appropriate approach for repairing work. Uh, furthermore, this information had been modified as a database and uh, the dam will be continuously monitored uh, the, by updating this database. In this database, profile of each crack is recorded. By comparing uh, all the data, the progress of this crack could be monitored. Also, once uh, the significant earthquake happened, safety of the dam could be checked. I want to show another example. This is a Rockfield dam. Uh, only by taking photo of the surface of the dam, we can estimate the particle size distribution uh, on the bottom graph uh, of the riprap can be obtained. Comparing to data when it was constructed, we can evaluate how much the riprap has been uh, deteriorated. Now I want to move back to my, the main subject, virtual inspection of ground anchors. So ground anchor is broadly used uh, for slope stabilization around the reservoir. I'm not sure how much you are familiar with this technology, so let me briefly explain its mechanism. The deep image on the right bottom uh, is a schematic chart of the ground anchor. Ground anchor can stabilize slope by giving a pre-stress uh, on a slip surface, a red line, red rush line, and pulling up the lump of earth as well. Anchor body, on the bottom in the middle of earth and uh, the anchor head is tightened by strings. The photo on the left, uh, okay, uh, normally the ground anchor is used as a group, not single, and only anchor heads are visible. In order to check the condition of uh, uh, anchors, there are, there are several challenges. The work field has a high and steep slope, which uh, is dangerous for workers. It covers very wide range, which requires a lot of time to look through. And it is uh, located around the reservoir, so they are submerged some, sometimes, depending upon the reservoir water level. It gives us uh, time constraints for field work. Uh, some of anchors equip a load cell to monitor the tension of strings, but not all, it's very costly. As a result, only visual inspection from remote place is possible, and it is very hard to inspect individually. You can see the photos of damaged uh, anchors. Uh, the objective of this study is to look through the current state of ground anchors for leading to appropriate uh, maintenance work in the future. It aims to make visual inspection efficient by using drone and to establish methodology uh, for primary screening uh, of lots of ground anchors. We are not researchers. This is an attempt to develop quite practical methodology for primary screening. So we have a few policies on this study. Uh, for economical reason, we try to refrain from using the high spec uh, drone, nor complex uh, analysis the theor theories. In, no, in other words, we should choose popular equipment and generic technology with the emphasis on uh, applicability. Before going to the detail, I briefly explain the process and the results in advance. In the field, uh, just shooting movies from different distance. And by observing the movies, visual inspection was made in, in the office. As a conclusion of this study, uh, some form for recording the inspection results was developed and optimal shooting distance was identified as 10 meter. 
it was found that 70% of laborious effort could be reduced comparing with conventional virtual visual inspection. Uh, this is a field for this study. This photo was taken from the reservoir. Uh, there is a dam operation office on the top of the hill. Completion of uh, this project is about 27 years ago. So these anchors have been working same years as well. When this study was conducted, uh, 148 numbers of ground anchors were visible. The others were under water. All of the anchors are capped with cast-in-place concrete. And the left, si left side, this is a used drone named Phantom 3 Professional, uh, which is the most popular model in, and cost around uh, 1,000 to 1,500 US dollar. Uh, this model has a pre-installed camera which has 8 megapixels and can take photo and movies. And for establishing the in inspection methodology, which provides consistent results, even applying for many different sites, it needs to be considered what is the uh, optimal distance for shooting movie. If the drone flies too close, uh, we could get a good picture with higher resolution, but it will take a longer time and we'll need to drive a drone very carefully, not to hit on the slope by unexpected turbulence. If it is too, f ah, sorry, it is too far, we will not be able to get sufficient images. In this study, three different distances were compared regarding these three things clearness of a movie, time spent time, and uh, risk on driving a drone. Firstly, I want to show the clearness of the movie. In the case of five meter distance, please look at the left side, a uh, picture of the concrete block seems large enough and the uh, deterioration of concrete cap can be identified. 10 meters, so so, 20 meter too not unclear and uh, not to identify. Additionally, using the model, resolution by each shooting distance was checked. This box represents concrete block, and uh, these lines represent cracks. As our conclusion, the obvious deformation, such as five millimeter width crack, is identifiable if the movie was shot from less than 10 meter. Okay. The, uh, the upper table summarizes the result of shooting distance. Taking into account the operation risk and time efficiency, we can say 10 meter is uh, most applicable. Without saying, if you use a higher spec camera instead of a pre-installed camera, you could keep more distance and work more time efficiently. You can see this, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, the, ah, sorry. And the lower table, uh, summarizes workload comparing the conventional inspection way. As you can see, using drone can reduce 70% of workload. Particularly, field work can be made very short, which can mitigate time constraints. It also provides safer work condition with less opportunity to meet any accident. Based on the obtained movie, the condition of each anchor head was uh, evaluated and the results including the photos taken from all aspects were input to the database. This form was one of the outputs from this study. It enables consistent and uh, practical ever evaluation for primary screening purpose. <coughs> Applying to all types of ground anchors around reservoirs. This study itself is very simple and uh, just a primary attempt for further development of the inspection methodology in this, in this field. However, in combination with AI or other technologies, a drone will help, help us for maintaining huge uh, number of infrastructures appropriately and extend, extend its life. That's uh, all, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have still two presenters left. The next one is Mr. T.K. Sivrajan from Central Water Commission. He would be presenting on sediment man management in reservoirs of run of the river hydropower projects and restrictions on drawdown flushing.
good morning to all here i will be just briefly touching upon one very crucial issue which we are facing in the operation and maintenance phase of our dams when it comes to the dam safety the next phase is once we kept the dam on a safe mode how to operate it so that it reaches its life there is no need of calling it as life because there is no specified life in the reservoir but to the extent possible in a useful economic way mainly when we are talking about the sediment management especially in the ror hydroelectric projects we are talking of two primary concerns one is the reservoir life storage and secondly the intake which we have to keep it safe from clogging and reservoir sedimentation just as a general overview just i am giving it because there are so many concerns about the sedimentation issue in the reservoir in 2015 cwc has published a compendium on the silting of the reservoirs which brought out many significant figures which practically there are some corners of the institutions they are trying to project in a very different picture but this is a very reliable and very in depth study carried out based on 239 reservoirs this document is available on cwc website it brought out the uh, average age of reservoirs and number of reservoirs within the what is the gross capacity loss that's the first column which is given that is less than 0.1 percentage loss is occurring is number of reservoirs is 17 and maximum is coming we are losing the reservoir storage that is about 0.1 to 0.5 percentage in about 126 reservoirs why i am just highlighting that particular second row is here this projection is uh, given sometimes even 1 percentage but this is a true fact which is given in the last slide which i am circled here if you see the overall study of cwc average annual percentage loss of gross storage is only of the order of about 0.42 percentage and when it comes to the live storage which is in the third row that is only about 0.04 percentage uh, just one very significant paragraph i took it from the reservoir practically it is a bible of the reservoir sedimentation which is morris and fan those who are familiar with the issue they may be knowing it reservoirs have traditionally been planned designed and operated on the assumption that they have a finite life frequently as short as 100 years which will eventually be terminated by sediment accumulation sedimentation problems are growing as today's inventory of reservoir ages and serve sediment problems are severe sediment problems are starting to be experienced as sites worldwide including major projects of national importance sediment management in reservoir is no longer a problem to be kept to be put off until the future it has become a contemporary problem a reservoir as i already told there is no defined life assets to the reservoir it passes through various phases the first phase is reservoir shows no adverse effect and is able to deliver full planned life this we can say some of called the service life pass on to the next phase progressively smaller benefits but it is economical phase 3 is it is started causing some sedimentation difficulties phase 4 and 5 which is the uh, practically the difficult phase is operation becomes impossible at one stage we have to completely uh, remove the reservoir or it is practically not possible to operate it fortunately none of the reservoirs in our country has reached the stage of 4 and 5 now the main focus is how to manage the sediments in reservoirs once it is constructed there are various strategies are available which i am just briefly indicating in the subsequent slides one is the reduce the sediment inflow by erosion control and upstream sediment trapping then route the sediments which is the most significant part because once the sediment is accumulated in the reservoir how to take out that and third is sediment removal the next is providing large storage volume which is we do in the storage projects then sediment placement this is only a broad outline of the 
measures, but there are significant measures which can be done in combination also of these two. Coming to the main focused area that is sediment routing and sediment flushing. Sediment routing encompasses all the approaches where you are removing the sediment, either minimizing the deposition or balancing the deposition and score during the flood periods. And sediment routing preserves the time-wise pattern of sediment transporting the stream. Now, when it comes to the sediment flushing approach, it is removes the accumulated sediment after they have been deposited in the reservoir and flushing modifies the time-wise pattern of sediment significantly. There is some uh, uh, clear-cut distinction is to be made. What exactly the flushing and sluicing and routing, all this terminology are sort of, it will be a bit intermixed. But in sub subsequent slide, I will just show you. The bottommost figure shows what is the sediment bypass approach, how to keep the sediment in an upstream reservoir, and sediment pass through. When it comes to the sediment flushing, broadly this can be categorized into two. There can be a drawdown flushing, which many of the hydropower operators and reservoir managers, they may be knowing it. And there is a lesser terminology which is called pressure flushing, which can be called as sluicing. And why this issue came into focus was, especially when we are dealing with our uh, projects in Chenab Basin and the Indus Water Treaty, due to the topographical constraint and due to the imposition of uh, reservoir drawdown by the treaty, we have to maintain the reservoir at a particular level. We cannot go down the reservoir below the MDDL. Then this issue of came up and our former chairman, uh, Sri A.B. Pandya, was also involved when we tried to devise some method by which we can quickly assess which method would give the uh, feasible service life operation. And second is, as far as hydropower designs are concerned, which we are mostly dealing with, when we are not giving any desilting chambers in our hydropower system, whether the reservoir itself can be manipulated in such a way by doing a combination of flushing and sluicing, we can prevent the sediment entry into the hydro power intake and indirectly we can minimize the siltation and the erosion of the runners. Then this issue came up and we uh, investigated in detail. Uh, drawdown flushing, that is empty or free, free flow flushing, uh, flushing is empty or free flow flushing which involves emptying the reservoir to the level of the flushing outlet, which is normally the sluice crust level and it will more or less like a riverine flow condition will be established and the sediment will get practically eroded in that and we are managing it. On the left corner I have indicated flushing channel and retrogressive erosion is the key word in that drawdown flushing. And on the right side is the pressure flushing which is called the sluicing which we are calling where we are not allowed to bring the reservoir below the MDDL. We have to only manage the sluicing operation just by manipulating the reservoir from FRL to MDDL. Now the study came into focus. This is a, just a schematic of what is drawdown flushing and what is a sluicing which shows. In sluicing, we can very well see we are not allowed to draw down the reservoir below a particular level and we have to manage the sediment pass through by creating a score code in the, near the spillway. This is again uh, more or less the actual schematic of the both the operations of the sluicing and the drawdown flushing. You can see drawdown flushing is a very effective method which practically removes. It is the bottom most uh, uh, lower table. Sluicing, though it is not that advisable, but there are reasons why you have to adopt the sluicing or the pressure flushing. And uh, the study importance I already told. And the this is what we have uh, examined in uh, consultation with DHI. We have carried out the method of sluicing, that is the pressure flushing, in, by employing some excellent numerical methods of uh, doing MIC-11 and MIC-21C by DHI. We have taken four projects in the Chenau Basin and the results were just analyzed to reach some kind of conclusions. Uh, step one is just utilizing MIC-11. This is a one-dimensional model. 
we established the equilibrium profile to be achieved in the reservoir by carrying out all the hydro, uh, hydrologic data and the sediment data incorporating into that. And step two is for the near the intake and the sluice, uh, dam sluices area, we have employed MIC 21C, which is a two-dimensional model, and we got the complete sedimentation pattern and the flow characteristics. And in the third phase, which is of importance, is how to assess what is the sediment entry into the intake. Because since we are not providing any desilting basin in the system, we have to ensure that only the permissible quantum of sediment of that particular fra fraction, say 0.2 mm, which is very common for high grade hydroelectric projects, or other fractions also, which is a medium and fine sediment, how much it would be entering into the intake. There we have to use a combination of both mic 21 c and the very well-known sedimentation profile that is called Vanoni profile. Utilizing that, we can establish how much would be the quantum of sediment which is entering into the power intake. This is some of the salient features of the four projects which has been considered in the Chennai Basin. Uh, in the elevation wise, I have indicated. With specific reasons, I could not give the name of the projects. The Selling features are already given in the paper also. And uh, this is the data, the significant data which has been used for, for all the four projects. We can see the sediment load concentrations has been given for, for all the four projects, which is of the order of the total sediment load is about 3 MCM in the first project, 4.26 MCM in the second project, and uh, 5.06 MCM in the thir four, third project and 11 MCM approximately in the fourth project. And the last table shows this results into an yield of about 0.5 mm per year in the first project and about 0.65 mm sediment yield in the second and third project and about 1.11 mm per year in the fourth project. Now, based on the results which we obtained from this numerical studies using this MIC-11 and MIC-21C, we reach certain conclusions, and the first one is the most significant one. Because in the case of pressure flushing or sluicing, the entire process is taking place because of the formation of a stable score cone, which we are calling it, which is shown in the diagram, uh, which is totally different when you are doing a drawdown flushing, where we are getting a riverine flow conditions. And uh, this is the results which you obtain when we do the uh, various steps. The first one is my 1D studies, where showing the advancement of the sediment profile. When we do for the many number of years, the sedimentation is being carried out in numerically, what would be the advancement of the sedimentation profile? And uh, the right side slide shows the 21C results, which shows the sedimentation pattern near the intake. And the photograph shows the dimensions of the score cone, which we are looking for. When you are doing a pressure flushing, our main focus is to obtain what is the uh, dimensions of the score cone which is likely to be formed. That we can obtain numerically using these methods. And uh, the second uh, results which we obtained was the equilibrium wet profile is simulated for all the cases with lower sluice crest elevations of deeper score cone preserving large life storage in comparison to cases with higher sluice spillway crust elevations. Because we have to keep the deeper sluices so that you will get a very uh, big and uh, uh, deep score cone for our better sediment pass through. Score cone is limited volume and hence requires frequent flushing, which is critical as far as hydropower project is concerned. Fourth one is the extent of score cone developed is almost constant for a particular project. This fourth one is also very significant, which you have found. In the previous slide, I have shown in the left column, even if uh, we change the sluice crest elevation, which is our bottom, almost the extent of the score cone is fixed. This is also one significant finding which you obtained from the numerical studies. And the results in summarized form it is given in this table. This particular uh, slide shows the summary of all the results of the whole four projects, which shows the score cone, which
which has been formed for all the four projects with different Lewis elevations. This shows the friction velocity, how it changes once we advance the reservoir from the, from the extreme of the reservoir to the dam location. This is, in summary, what is the Vanoni profile which is used for estimating the sediment entry into the power intake. And the conclusions of the study is, one, sluicing with the restriction on drawdown flushing has limited effectiveness, removing the sediment and preserving live storage of the reservoir. But this cannot substitute the complete drawdown flushing, that is emptying of the reservoir with deeply located sluices. Given to any project independently, if there is no restriction, one should go for drawdown flushing fully. Draw, uh, bring the reservoir up to the bottommost level of the sluice and remove the entire sediment. But there will be restrictions of topography or like in our industry water treaty, there will be restrictions. There we have to adopt the pressure flushing. Second one is effectiveness of sluicing for protection of power intake safeguard. The same for core sediment entry. Proper planning of intake and sluice with respect to its position. Lowering of spillway sluice is beneficial for preserving more life storage in comparison with higher sluice crust elevations and results into less entry of coarser sediment particles into power intake. The horizontal extent of score cone simulated for pressure flushing is not much affected by the crust elevation of the sluice spillway and may be specific to the site and flushing conditions. Adding existing thumb rule of longitudinal slope found to be vary from 20.2, Position the power intake well within the maximum extent of flushing cone. This is very important. How to plan the intake vis a vis the sluice crust level and location. The, to safeguard the power intake from excessive sediment entry, spill, uh, spillway crust elevation should be planned such that the equilibrium bed profile in front of the intake should remain well below the intake. Here we can use rouse vanani profile for computing the sediment entry. Thank you very much for the patient attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we come to the last presenter, Mr. K. Josie from Kerala Water Resources Department. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning to all. Topic of my presentation is the innovations in operations of multi-purpose, multi-valley, multi-reservoir system, its trends and uh, challenges. There are two co-authors uh, for this paper, Mr. Uh, Sudhir Padigal, Joint Director in our department, Water Resources Department, and Dr. K. Srinivasan, Professor, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Presentation is structured in three different sections. Firstly, we will discuss with the complexity, complexity of the problem. Then, simulation optimization framework uh, we will discuss. And case study related to Asia's largest interstate interbasin water transfer project, Parambikula Malia project, uh, which is executed and being operated by two states, Tamil Nadu and Government of Kerala since 1970, will be discussed. Coming to the complexity of the problem, as all of us know, if there is only one reservoir with a single purpose, its operation is very simple. But if the same reservoir has two objectives, both are conflicting in nature. For example, let us say if there is a reservoir which has to meet the demands of irrigation supply as well as power generation, then we know those objectives are conflicting. Whenever we supply water for irrigation, storage level, water storage in the reservoir will come down, which will adversely affect the uh, power generation. So whenever conflicting objectives are there for a uh, reservoir, then we have to do some trade-off uh, between these objectives whenever we derive operation policies. Now consider, in a river basin, there are many number of uh, reservoirs, each with a multi-purpose. Then complexity will be more. Configuration of the reservoir system also will uh, matter. If the reservoirs are located in series, whatever up upstream release from upstream reservoir will, will deliver to uh, the downstream, most, uh, downstream reservoirs. But if the reservoirs are uh, placed in uh, parallel configuration, then 
let us say uh, if all the reservoirs are simultaneously uh, getting uh, spilled we will feel that that, that system is entirely uh, really good just for the reason there is no under utilization all the reservoirs are functioning uh, to its uh, maximum benefit but if the downstream channel if the, if it does not have any channel carrying capacity for to accommodate all the spilling uh, from all the reservoirs then it will be disaster now now we are think, uh, now let us think of uh, many inter basins where many multi purpose multi reservoir systems are uh, located and all these things are interlinked complexity will be uh, many fold now if all this uh, inter basin uh, multi purpose multi reservoirs are located within a country or within a state within a state then uh, things are very simple now let us say there is a sharing between two different states just like our uh, parambikulam maliyar project uh, inter state uh, 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 agreement between tamil nadu and kerala then there will be there will be lot of political uh, conditions agreement conditions to be satisfied so that will uh, that also will add to the uh, constraints so to derive operation policies uh, for this kind of system uh, is really challenging over the last 4 uh, to 5 decades many uh, researchers have uh, taken this problem and they tried their level best to uh, some uh, uh, to uh, derive some operation policies earlier we can see, we, we know that uh, computation facilities are very less so those days what mainly what they were doing if there are uh, number of reservoirs they will group into uh, some equivalent reservoirs for example if there are nine reservoirs they will group into three reservoirs some aggregation they will do then after uh, deriving the policies then they will decompose to individual uh, reservoir operations and whatever results we get from uh, uh, those kind of uh, uh, derived uh, operation policies when it, when we apply into the practical field then it will not uh, suit to the uh, real situations now we are uh, uh, suggesting a, a concept of simulation and optimization uh, network why uh, we have uh, taken this uh, parambikulam maliyar project of course there are many researchers they have uh, dealt with this problem uh, mainly uh, with respect to linear programming non linear programming dynamic programming stochastic dynamic programming etc etc and all this uh, de developed models have lot of limitations when it comes to the practical uh, since we uh, deal with uh, kerala and tamil nadu deal with uh, this particular project we know what are the constraints and when uh, this uh, derived operation policies are applied in the field uh, we find it is very difficult this is the uh, parambikulam uh, alia project as i told you it is the largest state in asia in the state uh, this thing uh, since uh, there is no pointer you can see the red line it divides between tamil nadu and kerala the most important thing is that uh, there are one vr upper nearer vr and uh, eight reservoirs and uh, this uh, nine reservoir system when it is interlinked with the tunnels canals and uh, 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 many other conveying system the most important aspect is nothing but uh, total uh, yield of the project is 50 tmc it comes around 1400 mm cube share of uh, tamil nadu is uh, nearly 30 tmc whereas the share of kerala is 90.5 tmc but beauty of this uh, interbasin transfer is that beauty of uh, this the uh, interbasin transfer is that um all the reservoirs uh, located in tamil nadu compared to its yield storage capacity is nearly half but when it comes to the main uh, reservoir located in kerala parambikulam you can read that parambikulam its yield is 270 but storage is uh, 550 550 520 something like that so whatever uh, uh, water yield is getting uh, 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 from the other weir and other reservoirs it is pulled to uh, parambikulam and from from parambikulam it is uh, given to uh, the main reservoirs in uh, tamil nadu that is tirumurthi uh, you can see this is the tirumurthi and all the system starts from here it is interlinked like this and this is the major reservoir located in uh, kerala parambikulam and coming to the coming to its uh, demand at this point tirumurthi its uh, yield is only 45 million meter cube and capacity is only 54 million meter cube and their eye cut is 138000 hectare and irrigation demand is with a storage of 54 million meter cube with a yield of uh, 45 million meter cube its uh, irrigation demand is uh, 700 million meter cube 
So, and uh, coming to the agreement conditions, as I told you, 50 TMC is the total, total yield, and Kerala's share is the 19.5 uh, TMC. So, Tamil Nadu has to, as per the agreement conditions, Tamil Nadu has to meet uh, certain demands. Coming to Uh, coming to the, uh, there are three basins. This one is the uh, Periyar River Basins, and center one is the uh, Chalakudi River Basins, and this is the uh, Bharadapuda uh, River Basin. And uh, irrigation demand is in uh, uh, Bharadapuda River Basin. And uh, demand is, uh, as per agreement conditions, Tamil Nadu has to uh, deliver 7.25 TMC in Bharadapuda Basin for Kerala. And it has to uh, deliver 7.25 TMC uh, in Chalakudi Basin. And in the upper reaches, four, in four months, from October to uh, January, and there Tamil Nadu uh, tapped uh, 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 yield from their nearer, it should be completely transferred to uh, uh, Kerala. Uh, what I want to say, when this kind of agreement conditions comes, again, uh, it's uh, modeling and it's uh, decision, uh, arriving at the operation policies, it makes uh, more uh, challenging. This is the system. It's a 3D, 3D model of this uh, uh, model is uh, displayed in our uh, ex exhibition store of Water Resources Department, Government of uh, Kerala, outside. And uh, most of the uh, rivers which are flowing towards the western side, it is diverted to eastern side. As I told you, uh, 1,38,000 hectares in Tirumurthi and uh, uh, nearly 28,000 hectares in uh, Alia. Schematically, uh, this is the... Uh, 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 schematic layout, you can just uh, see uh, uh, there are one uh, uh, VR as well as uh, uh, eight uh, uh, dams. Canal system, nearly it has uh, 500 kilometers canal, main canal itself is uh, 250 kilometers and it's a branches, distributaries like that. And there are four uh, power houses located in uh, three, uh, three reservoirs with a generation capacity of 70, 25, 54 and 30 megawatts. Since the time is limited, I don't have time to uh, explain in detail, but uh, uh, this uh, interstate inter and water transfer is uh, really a marvel. Uh, credit goes to our uh, uh, engineers uh, who planned and uh, constructed, executed this work in 1970. Now, what I want to say, as I told you, such a system, it's uh, uh, deriving its operation policy is uh, really difficult. So the methods, methodology suggested is nothing but simulation, then optimization. Actually, what is meant by simulation? Simulation, simulation is nothing but individual reservoirs, its uh, physical character characteristics, like uh, its uh, drawdown level, its uh, canal sluice levels, its canal carrying capacity, its tunnel carrying capacity, turbine capacity, full reservoir level, all those things will be sim uh, simulated. And as an individual, as well as a basin-based transfer, and it's as a system, it will be, uh, it will be uh, simulated. Now, as I told you, there are three uh, conflicting uh, objectives. One is drinking water supply. Its demand is less uh, when we consider the overall system. But irrigation demand is uh, really high. And coming to the power generation, all these three uh, co objectives are con con conflicting. So when we um, uh, made this simulation model, uh, drinking water supply was given first, first priority. It was in the model we have built as a mandatory. Then coming to the irrigation uh, demand and power generation, then we thought of uh, some kind of trade-off. Trade so simulation model, uh, what kind of uh, trade-off we are uh, going to do? In, individually, each reservoir, uh, we are considering its irrigation demand. What will be, uh, what will be the irrigation release? and what will be the irrigation deficit. So one objective function will be nothing but irrigation deficit of individual reservoirs. And when we add all those things in a particular month, that will be the system irrigation deficit. So our objective will be nothing but minimizing the irrigation uh, deficit. And coming to the generation side, objective is nothing but maximize the power generation. As I told you, there are three reservoirs with the po po four power houses. So that objective function will be nothing but maximizing the uh, power generation. So those kind of uh, two objective functions are built in uh, simulation model. And whenever we, we uh, develop a simulation model, some kind of re reliability we have to uh, put in. Here, reliability with respect to fam energy, monthly fam energy of uh, system uh, fam energy is uh, inbuilt uh, with a re reliability constraint of 95%. Since uh, time is short, uh, 
these are the two objective functions. I am not going to the formulation side. These are the two objective functions. You can see the Z1. That deals with the uh, deficit is nothing but irrigation demand. IRD is nothing but irrigation demand. IRR is irrigation release. You can see INK. It uh, represents the number of res reservoirs. And uh, in the outside sigma, you can see outside loop, loop. You can see number of months and outside uh, uh, this thing over the years. As I told you, this system is the PAP is uh, uh, complete, was completed in 1970. We have 45 years of data, 45 to 47. So all this historical data will be uh, uh, given as an input uh, to the uh, simulation model. These are the various constraints. Basically, it is nothing but a, a continuity equation, which uh, every uh, all hydrology uh, engineers know. So uh, based on the continuity equation, what will be the final storage with respect to the initial storage? It's uh, released from upstream uh, reservoirs. It's uh, its own inflow, evaporation, detecting evaporation loss, detecting release, and de detecting spillway, etc. That's a, a part of the modeling. In addition to these constraints, as I told you, all interstate agreement conditions. Now, um, there uh, in Kerala Sholayar, Tamil Nadu has to, uh, Kerala Sholayar Dam will get uh, uh, water from Tamil Nadu Sholayar. So there is an agreement condition. It is really interesting. Over the, in a year, they have to supply, they have to give 12.3 TMC to Kerala. Not only that, they have to maintain two major, uh, important levels. On September 1st, Kerala Sholayar should be kept at uh, its FRL. And on January, uh, February 1st, again, they have to uh, keep uh, at its FRL. Remaining months, the difference should be only uh, five feet. So those kind of agreement conditions are there. These are the uh, modeling side. Reliability const uh, constraint as far as the uh, fair manage is concerned, it is inbuilt. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, simulation. And on, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, GA coding. As I told you, I have, uh, re we have referred the uh, earlier uh, research in this field. And th though there are uh, eight reservoirs, there are two small reservoirs very adjacent to Parambikulam, Tonakadava and Perivari Pallam. So we have grouped uh, those three reservoirs and changed uh, the entire system into six reservoirs and one uh, uh, VR. After uh, the, uh, um, uh, developing the simulation model, when it comes to the optimization side, we understood that decision variables minimum required is 180, 180 for such a system. So just uh, imagine, to find an optimum solution for a problem having 180 uh, uh, variables, how difficult it will be. So there comes the uh, optimization, uh, the advantage of the optimization module. We, we are uh, uh, adopting NSGA2, nothing but a, a non-dominated sorting, a genetic algorithm 2 version we are using. Here in the simulation model, you can see input uh, uh, files monthly inflow, uh, monthly final storage, irrigation demand, supply demand, evaporation, fair energy, like that, so many parameters. In the subroutines, that comes to the uh, calculation state. We should know whenever uh, when some demand is there, we should calculate whether available water storage is there. So those kind of subroutine uh, calculations you can see in the simulation model. Module. In the genetic algorithm, you can see 180 variables, which will be uh, derived uh, from uh, optimization module. And uh, uh, the advantage of the optimization model is that though we have 45 years of data, this optimization model can generate infinite number of uh, generations. It can be 1,000, 10,000, lakh, whatever it may be. So these the decision variables will go to the simulation model and it will run the uh, program. It will compare with the previous result. Again, like that, it can each generation uh, optimization model, whatever the decision variables will go to the simulation model, it will compare and finally, it will, we will get uh, optimum monthly operations. Strategy is nothing but a, a long term uh, st uh, operation policy we will derive. Once the monthly operation policies are derived, then based on each month, month uh, operation policy, weekly uh, uh, policies will be derived. Now coming to the conclusion slide, uh, uh, these are the conclusions. Uh, as I told you, the complexity of the uh, system uh, I already uh, conveyed. And we understand that uh, simulation optimization framework is the most advantageous uh, uh, methodology to derive operation policies for such a interstate, interbasin, multipurpose, multi-valley, multi-reservoir system, where all the systems are linked, all the individual systems are linked with the con tunnels, canals, uh, and over, over and above uh, agreement, uh, political agreement conditions. By completing the study proposed here and making its findings an integral part of the existing institutional arrangements of 
PAP, it is expected that in such situations, the system can be managed in a safe and sustainable manner. When I say it is a uh, safe and sustainable manner, uh, recent experience, just in 2014, what we observed, that I can share you and I will uh, conclude. In 2014, we understood that uh, in Periyar Basin, that is the southern, uh, southern side, it was flooding during the monsoon. And in the Middle East, nothing but Chalakodi Basin. And the lower portion is the Bharadapura Basin. In that year, Bharadapura Basin, we faced uh, water scarcity. It was a drought. And it was flooding in the uh, Periyar Basin. So it was not properly managed or properly anticipated. So whatever water is, was coming from the uh, Periyar, it was uh, when it uh, reached uh, Chalakodi Basin reservoirs, that starts, uh, those reservoirs start spilling. Immediately, it was decided to cut off to cut whatever supply from the uh, Periyar. So all the Periyar water uh, just uh, went to the downstream most uh, reservoir in Kerala, which has a capacity of 1,050 million meter cube. And uh, it filled up and it uh, just uh, spilled and uh, all water just went to the sea. So if it was properly managed, the lower basin, Bharatapada basin, those, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't have faced a uh, drought. So thank you all uh, for patient hearing. Once again, thank you all. Uh, friends, with uh, these, uh, though slightly late, but we have come to the end of the presentation. So before we finally wind up, a uh, couple of words from my um, uh, uh, co-chairman here, Mr. R. Jaisilan, who is the former... That is, they all exceeded except one in time. Okay, now we have talked about, you know, what it should be or how it should be. But now it is time to look into what is the level of application and implementation, the level of compliance to requirements. I think it's worthwhile taking a case study of different projects that will reveal what, in what stage we are. And in reference to the subject today, it starts with operation maintenance, but dam safety issues begin even before that with design and construction. I'm saying this because recently, in the past five years, I have handled project failures resulting from design and you know, construction quality control. Mr. Ueda, he in his presentation, he included due diligence for design, quality control mechanism, right? Now, I would like to flag one issue with the EPC type of contracts being executed. The design is the casualty. In the, you know, to economize, you know, the costs, designs, you know, they take shortcuts, and some of them have led to failures right in the first filling or first commissioning. In one of the projects outside, construction supervision done by Indian firm, when I happened to see the drawings, I said, this will fail, better have it re-examined. And it was referred to the design consultant. And he replied back saying, the design is safe. Any change will mean extra cost. In the right in the first filling, the whole thing collapsed. And in one of the projects here in India itself, a 45 meter high dam got washed out and I was asked to investigate and suggest remedial measures. When I saw the drawings, the, my first remark was, if it has not failed, it should have been an exception. So dam safety, you know, it begins from that stage itself. I have a lot of failures, but I'm hesitating to present because I have been told by the owners not to highlight the failures because we will be in trouble. Bangalore, I made a presentation and I was conveyed the same message. And that's why I refrained from doing that in this conference. And also, you see, construction. Now, a dam of over 100 meters high, it is leaking at every lift joint and a non-overflow 
profile, which is expected to be dry, it is flowing with a sheet of water. And with a channel and a V-notch arrangement, they are measuring the seepages. So you can imagine. And also, in this stilling basin, trees are growing. Probably they are expecting to reap fruits from that. <laughs> That's the level of maintenance. So implementation is very important. I am saying this only with concern for the safety of the projects. And in one of the projects recently, M50 concrete, 5-0, which is supposed to be corrosion, you know, erosion resistant. In the first flood, the whole thing got eroded out. You can imagine, you know, how important is the construction, supervision, and quality control. So when we are talking about operation and maintenance, I would like you to be careful even before in the stages of design and construction supervision. I would like to reiterate that. And then one more thing is when I was talking to some of my colleagues from CWC itself, some of these failures that have taken place, they were quite unaware of what has happened, many of them. So there should be a system of reporting of unexpected behavior from projects or any failures, not for condemning or criticizing somebody, but to learn out of those failures. I think this DSO should include a clause for reporting of any unexpected behavior or any, even if it's a minor failure also, it should be reported back. There should be a compilation for the benefit of the future generation to learn from the failures. Since the time is very short, I would like to stop here and hand the mic back to the chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, a quick word from another co-chairman, uh, Mr. Satoru. Uh, thank you very much. A very quick comments. And the last two, I mean, all presentation are excellent. Thank you very much. But the last two presentation from India has given me uh, some thoughts about the need for further uh, discussions, technical discussion on the uh, comprehensive sediment management plan and also integrated reservoir operation on basin scale. And uh, I, I understand now this the sedimentation is becoming a major uh, issue for reservoir uh, sustainability in, in India. And uh, okay, just the uh, drawdown, the uh, flushing and sluicing is a very important subject is also consistent with our discussion and our projects. But I think it's at the high time to discuss more the comprehensive sediment management plans and covering the both technical and economic and the financial aspects and of what would be the most uh, suitable options for, 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 for the future. Perhaps, uh, you know, this uh, uh, drip has been dealing with many important dam safety aspects under the project, perhaps, but the sediment management is also becoming an uh, important subject that can be covered by this project. I imagine, and also that's the integrated uh, reservoir management uh, in terms of this uh, flood and drought and power generation and uh, how to establish this uh, optimized water allocation system, perhaps uh, coupled with flood forecasting, hydrometing system. We can also learn from the uh, different parts of the world. We can have a, uh, the, uh, you know, a similar kind of a session to exchange an ideas. And we have uh, uh, been working with uh, various uh, experts, uh, particularly for sediment management, uh, Dr. Mollis, Dr. Anandel. Uh, we have been working uh, closely with them, so perhaps we can also benefit for this uh, the drip project in here in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with this, we come to the end. Actually, there is no time for any question answer. And uh, so a big thank you for all the presentation. A thank you to all my uh, co-chairmen, uh, the report here, and a big thank you to all for being very uh, patiently uh, listening to all the presentation. Thank you very much. Before we wind up, I request all the presenters to come kindly come up on the dais to take a photograph.
Chair, may I now invite the Chairman to present the mementos to the presenters, Dr. Sanjay Giri. Mr. Narendra Kumar. Mr. Tatsu Kuneda. Mr. TK Sivarajan. Mr. K. A. Joshi. And now to the reporter, Mr. Anil Jain. Co-chairman, Mr. R. Jaya Silam. Mr. R. Jaya Silam. Co-chairman and presenter, Mr. Satoru Yueda. May I now invite Dr. Anton J. Slice, President Ico, to present the memento to the Chairman. The Chairman, Mr. U.P. Singh. Thank you. We will now break for tea. The tea break is for 30 minutes and kindly be present to the hall after the tea break. Yes, the last one. The last one. Then. Yes.
I'll request all the delegates to please be seated. And uh, the person who's conducting this session kindly take control of the proceedings. I'll also request the organizers to kindly usher in all the delegates. I think they must have by now finished their tea and coffee. The other parallel session has already started. We are slightly late. All the delegates, please occupy the seat in the auditorium. Let us start the session. Welcome to the technical session, Operation, Maintenance, Rehabilitation and Upgrading of Existing Dams. Now, Chairman for the session, Dr. Anton Jeshlis. Dr. Anton Jeshlis is the President of International Commission on Large Dams, ICOL. He worked as the Head of the Hydraulic Structure Section in the Hydropower Department of Electrowatt Engineering Limited and was involved in the design of many hydropower projects around the world as an expert on hydraulic engineering and underground waterways. In 1997, he was nominated professor and became director of the Laboratory of Hydraulic Constructions of Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne. He has also involved as an international expert in several dam and hydropower plant projects all over the world, as well as flood protection projects mainly in Switzerland. From 2006 to 2012, he was director of the Civil Engineering Department of EPFL. He is also the former chairman of the Swiss Committee of Dams and the Swiss Committee of Flood Protection. Welcome you, sir, for the session. Let me invite the co-chairman, Sri Hiteshi Sasahara. Sri Hiteshi Sasahara is Deputy Secretary General of Network of Asian River Basins Organization, NARBU, and Director of International Affairs Division, Japan Water Agency, Japan. Sri Sahara is graduated from Hokkaido University and joined Japan Water Agency in 1980. His specialization is in investigation and planning, design and maintenance of dams. Welcome you, sir, to the session. Let me invite the second co-chairman, Sri Sanjay Kundu. Sri Sanjay Kundu is Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Water Resources, Government of India. He holds an advanced degree in public policy from University of Minnesota, USA. He is the Chairman of Brahmaputra Board and Chairman and Managing Director of National Project Construction Company Limited and Director General of National Water Development Agency. He also worked with United Nations as Deputy Commissioner, which gave him rich experience in nation building in conflict and post-conflict countries. He has been awarded the President of India Police Medal for Gallantry, Meritorious Service and Distinguished Services. He is also recipient of UN Medals. Welcome you, sir, to the session. Now, the rapporteur of the session, Sri T.K. Shivarajan, Chief Engineer, Central Water Commission, New Delhi. Welcome you, sir, to the session. And over to you, Chairman, for the session. Dr. Anjoon Jishles, thank you. Okay, okay, good morning everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here, the chairman of this session number 3A on uh, dam safety management and practices. And I think we start immediately um, with the presentations. We have six presentations, and the first presenter is my co-chairman. It's uh, Mr. Hideshi Sasahara, and uh, he will speak on recent efforts for better dam safety practices.
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain the, uh, introduce, introduce the Japan Water Agency. Japan Water Agency is uh, the sole organization, the river based organization in Japan, and uh, jurisdicted, uh, jurisdicting the seven river systems in Japan. The area of the seven river system is only 70% of uh, nationwide, of, uh, all nation areas, but uh, uh, the, in terms of the uh, uh, population and the industrial shipment, uh, it, those uh, seven river systems scored around half of entire Japan. And uh, Japan, uh, Japan also one of the recipient country of the uh, ODA, especially the World Bank. And uh, one of our projects, it's a first project uh, of uh, Japan Water Agency, it was also the, uh, receive, receiving the uh, World Bank loan. And uh, that project is near Nagoya, and it completed uh, in 1961. And uh, uh, the beneficiary area accumulated a lot of money, uh, especially cash. Uh, the one, uh, one farmer's association uh, already deposited around uh, uh, one trillion yen. It's, uh, it means around 100, uh, sorry, 10 billion US dollars. And the JWA is uh, the, uh, designated under the, under the four ministries. And one is the minister MLIT is, uh, MLIT is the flood control and maintenance flow and uh, uh, water rights. And the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, MAFF, is the uh, irrigation water. MHLW uh, is for the uh, domestic water. And METI is the industrial water. JWA is coordinating those ministries to, uh, uh, to achieve, to, uh, to make the uh, good, uh, good circumstances among the stakeholders of water resources utilizer. <laughs> and uh, JWA is also taking a role of the taking a role of the uh, Secretariat of the Network of Asian River Basin Organizations, NARVO. And currently the chairperson is uh, Mr. Imam Santos, who is uh, uh, from Indonesia. And, uh, and the Secretariat is composed of the JWA, uh, ADB and ADB Institute and the CRBOM. And uh, NARVO is supporting from the uh, World Bank and uh, JICA too. Then so the uh, area of the NAVO is now spreading to the 90, uh, 19 countries and 92 organizations are a member. And uh, we are doing the various activity. And now we are, making, uh, we are drafting the new guidelines uh, regarding the appropriate and applicable approach, focusing on the easy and low cost technology and uh, inclusive governance approach in Asian country, uh, the, which uh, materials uh, uh, is now, uh, materials are uh, now uh, collecting from the members of the NAVO. And uh, sorry, and uh, <coughs> uh, from, from this uh, slide, I would like to introduce the recent activities of JWA. Uh, maybe, as you know, uh, Japan is now facing the decrease of the population. So that this means this causes the decrease of the uh, workers of the construction. So uh, it is indispensable for us to achieve the effective and efficient construction technology application. And uh, this is one of the uh, examples. And uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, heavy machine, bulldozer, is no operator, just only moving by the, uh, uh, moving by the automatically and use, uh, utilizing the GNSS global na navigation satellite systems. And uh, when I was young, I was, uh, I was the supervisor of the dam construction project. And those days, I always used the hand to understand, monitor the water content ratio and uh, a compaction ratio. But uh, no nowadays, uh, around 20 years ago, uh, uh, we started the development of this kind of the automatic technologies. And uh, around five years ago, Japanese government uh, already issued a guideline on this kind of the technology. Then, uh, luckily, uh, I don't need to use hand, but uh, uh, as one of the engineer, I would like to uh, accumulate uh, continuously is the capability of the, my hand. And uh, next, one, next slide, the upper, please be give, uh, show us the upper, upper figures. And we are also utilizing the uh, ICT technology for the dam monitoring, especially the, uh, to monitor the uh, behavior of the dam, dams, dam body, uh, and utilizing the GN, uh, GPS. And also, we are using a lot of ICT technology to uh, monitor the fluctuation of the motor pump and uh, 
uh, motor pump and the control systems. And the uh, uh, lowest uh, photo is a lady, lady's photo. It shows uh, showing the uh, mount head display, uh, head mount display. And uh, use, uh, that is a, this, this bar is a camera. And uh, the expert or the, the, uh, uh, the person having the uh, knowledge and uh, experiences are monitored in the office. And so this course, this is very util useful for the uh, capacity building of young engineers as well as uh, the uh, reduction of the t taking time of experts. And uh, so, and uh, of course, we are using the, this kind of the CIM, construction information management. It's a digitalized information are uh, slotted into these kind of the systems. Then uh, I, I, we will use uh, this information for the monitoring and the maintenance. Then, and this is one of the samples. Recently, the drone utilization is one of the, uh, one of the typical, uh, uh, typical uh, application. Then, so this is the case of Indonesia. They are also using the drone uh, to check the uh, effectiveness and, uh, sorry, effectiveness of the uh, flush of the sedimentation from dam. <laughs> and uh, also, they are also utilizing this kind of the easy and low cost technology. And all the materials of this machine and equipment are procured from the local market in Indonesia. So, India and not only India, but also whole the Asian country can be fo can follow this kind of the appropriate approach. And so thank you very much for your taking time. I would like to catch up the, uh, uh, I would like to catch up the time to, to, for the punctual lunch time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, keeping uh, the timing. So you have in principle eight minutes left. Uh, so therefore I can give uh, the floor to the second co-chair. He has uh, five minutes more if you, if you need. So I have the pleasure to, to uh, announce uh, Mr. Sanchai Kundu. He is Joint Secretary at uh, CR, uh, CRC, and uh, he will uh, speak about dam safety initiatives in India. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Co-Chair. Thank you, the audience. After hearing so many experts, the question is, Dam safety is fine, but what is Government of India doing about it? So, I am taking this part of the problem and I like to cover it within 10 minutes scheduled to me. First of all, why dam safety? Second is, what about dam failures? Third is, how has dam safety practices evolved in India? Has there been any evolution? Are we going towards the right path? And lastly, what are the current initiatives of Government of India? What is Government of India doing about it after so many conferences, after so many interaction with international experts? So why dam safety? There are over 5,200 large dams in India. 447 are under construction. These are large dams. But there are medium and smaller dams which are outside the radar of dam safety in India. 213 dams are over 100 years old. So this is a serious issue because the ministry and CWC gets called every time in the Supreme Court whenever there is an issue of dam safety. Recently, last month also, this month also there was a case. Previously also there, is, there have been cases. So the question that Supreme Court also asked is, what is Government of India doing about it? The dams are aging. They have deficiencies in their structures, operation and monitoring. And a lot of them were built in a regime when the present set of standards, both structurally and hydrologically, were not there. So this is a big issue. Second thing in India, unlike countries which have staple population is, when the dams were built in India, they were in remote locations. But as our population has grown, there is population in the vicinity around the dams and also downstream of the dams. So that is why dam safety is paramount for India. Uh, whenever we speak, speak of dams and water resources projects, the basic question asked by public, NGOs, parliamentarians is, are your dams safe? What is government doing about it, dams? So basically, I don't need to explain the consequences of dam failure. It's a serious hazard. 
I called also has said that till 1965 there were 200 dams failures. CWC said that there, there have been 36 dam failures in India. Yesterday when Dr. Anton was making his presentation, he said that there are 60,000 large dams in the world. So we are about 10% of this. And our dam failure rate is slightly higher than 10%. So I think we need to bring it to the best standards in the world. The first dam failure hap happened in 1917. And uh, most of the failures are associated with new dams. So probably their design is faulty. Uh, the construction is done in a haste. Uh, Dr. J. Silan said that a lot of these designs are faulty. Yesterday I was hearing uh, Dr. Mukesh Gupta. He says there is so much of pressure in India to complete the projects in time that the design and uh, quality and uh, safety standards, probably they need proper attention. So this is basically the age profile of dams which have failed. But our experience says it is the newly dam built dams which are most prone to dam failure in India. I think it is because of bad design, bad safety parameters. And breaching is the major cause, overtopping the next. And there are issues of problem on foundation, dam body and slope failure. So who owns dams in India? Who are the owners of dams in India? Dams are owned by the central government, central PSUs like Bakra Bias Management Board, Damodar Valley Corporation, National Hydroelectric Power Corporation, other NP, uh, PSUs, state governments. And recently, in last few years, the private companies have also started owning dams in India. Now, what are the practices? They vary from state to state. They vary from organization to organization. So what is center doing about it? The question that is asked to the Ministry of CWC is, what are you doing about it? So what we are trying to do is evolve common safety standards and practices and try to encourage the states and dam owning organizations to follow them. So how has the dam safety organization, dam safety as an institution, as a practice evolved in India? First was dam safety organizations were formed, dam safety procedures were made, National Committee on Dam Safety was formed. On Monday we had the 38th meeting of National Committee on Dam Safety. Then there was another committee on seismic design parameters. Then there was a project. Basically, this was a World Bank funded project, Dam Safety Assurance and Rehabilitation Project. It was successful, but there were not many takers. Then came DRIP, and it is under the aegis of DRIP that we are meeting today. And lastly, Government of India is also considering dam safety legislation. Our friend, the World Bank chief, said that Institutional and legal architecture is extremely important for dam safety. Otherwise, it is sort of a persuasive advice. People can take it or they cannot take it. How did this thing evolve? When India went into dam building spree for its uh, water security, food security, energy security, the issue of dam safety came up. So this issue was raised for the first time in 1975. And the ministers recommended that we should have a body. So dam safety organization within the CWC came about in 1979. Subsequently, CWC persuaded other states also. They also formed the dam safety organizations. So what does DSO do? Basically, it compiles guidelines for safety inspections, checklists, everything. They do everything for dams in India. So Government of India constituted standing committee under the chairmanship of chairman CWC. Basically, it was to review the practices and evolve policies. So what did the committee do? Basically, it outlined the role of dam safety organization in the center within the CWC. It also outlined the structure, functions, and other things for the dam safety organizations within the state. But that time also in 1982, this committee said there has to be a central legislation. So we are struggling with this kind of legislation for last over now 35 years, and we are trying to take it forward. In 1987, National Committee on Dam Safety was constituted under the chairmanship of CWC. We recently held the 38th meeting, and it has been reconstituted from time to time to basically get membership of states and other organizations also. This is the overarching body within India. So it oversees dam safety activities. It uh, suggests improvements. And it is a forum of exchange also, and it follows up action also. 
So it is the only sort of an umbrella organization within India. Then there was this uh, Seismic Design Parameter National Committee. It is chaired by member Design and uh, Research, CWC. It has members from experts bodies and they basically make recommendations for dams. As I told you, DRIP had a precursor, Dam Safety Assurance and Rehabilitation Project. It was limited in its value also and scope also. So there were only four states which took part. The value was less and the objectives were very little. So basically improve the dam and improve the facilities, improve DSO. Only 55 dams were taken up. Now the big thing happened was dam rehabilitation and improvement program. So this was taken up in 2012. There were seven states participating and there are three other agencies, CWC and one agency from Kerala, one agency from Tamil Nadu. The cost has gone up. So 80% of it is in loan and 20% is center state. Basically center or state basically participation. It was a six year program. Now it has been extended to another two years and the value has also been added because it is a successful program. World Bank recon recognizes this as a successful program. So why this program is successful? It has very robust objectives. First is rehabilitation improvement of dam. That is basically the physical part. But what, what was important was that dam safety institution had very limited capacity. So second objective, very robust, was strengthening of that capacity. Third is project management. Basically, when you are managing so many dams,
inter of operations, the owner of this dam, the Engadiner Kraftwerke, they decided to make uh, a lot, uh, quite a lot of uh, refurbishment and renewal uh, works on this dam. And uh, uh, among others, there was also the, the revision of the bottom outlet gate and of the water intake, which provides the river below the dam with water. It was planned to do this refurbishment work uh, with uh, an empty lake. They wanted to drain the lake completely and then do this work under dry conditions. And this was the plan, what, what uh, somehow is a conventional solution to do it like that. But then there was a heavy environmental incident end of March uh, 2013. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of sediment deposits on the lake bed. As Professor Schley said yesterday already, uh, the sediments are the big brother from, uh, from uh, climate change. So also here there are a lot of water, so certainly all water, all the killed, all the life in this river. So they had to, uh, in Gardiner Kraftwerk, they had to uh, rethink how they want to realize this project and they, came, they had to come up with another solution, uh, hydro exploitation. We offered them a solution uh, to realize this work with a high level, high sea level. And uh, hydro exploitation is uh, our core business is operation and maintenance of, uh, of uh, power, hydropower plants. We are running around uh, 45 hydropower plants in the south uh, western part of Switzerland in behalf of the owners. We are a service provider. So we came up with a new solution uh, which, uh, is, uh, pro which proposed to seal the, the bottom outlet with uh, bulkheads at a depth of 90 meters and so the sea level could be kept uh, lake level. After completion of preparatory works was four months in which we have to complete all the 10,200 square meter. Due to the early setting in of the monsoon in the second lean season, that is uh, between uh, May and October, the uh, monsoon was early setting and then uh, the transportation of debris was a problem and so the, hence the schedule was modified. Uh, in that particular season where we had programmed to complete the entire stretch we could hardly do hardly 10% of the total area to be covered, though we are ready with all the material, all the manpower from Europe, all the inspection gang, all the local support, nothing was left behind. The whole, project, whole target with the support of the client was to complete it within the season itself so that the dam is free for them to operate. Then the preparatory work consists of uh, the desilting, and uh, while desilting, we came across some surprise. That is, we found there are about uh, six lateral walls, each about one to 1.5 meter width and depth up to the end, which are a major instance because it was very difficult task to remove that. And overall uh, desilting work, at least we could do it between zero to 117 instead of zero to 252. And the problem we face in racking painting also because of the climate condition, then we did the hydro jetting to, you know, to, to remove the uns, unstable parts. Motor was level on top and bottom seals. Wherever we put the seal, that need to be, that surface need to be smooth so that there is a flush contact between the seal and the dam body. A yeah, high strength motor is used to obtain very sound and hard surface for the anchors of the seal. And uh, now the, we go to the acceleration of the vertical anchoring system. This is uh, geomembrane is anchored against uh, wind uplift by vertical assemblies of two tensioning profiles. The lower tensioning profiles are fixed at designated, designed site-specific, site-specific stainless steel steel anchor, anchor rods embedded in chemical piles, fasten the profiles to the machinery. This is more or less the same as what we do in Kadambare and a drainage band placed under the profile facilitates the drained water to flow to the bottom collection and discharge chambers. 
works carried out from suspended platforms with winches manufactured in India under the guidelines of Swiss technology. An antipacture geotextile was supplied in two meter wide rolls, is used from the, is deployed from the top to the bottom, fixed by impact anchors. Wowrich Siblon uh, uh, geo composite was rolled, that is also supplied with the same uh, rolls, same width. Then geo composite was seamed. The aggregation sheets of geo composites are joined by hot air welding hot air seaming, the upper tensioning profile is fixed over the lower tensioning profile and adequate torque is provided to anchor and tension the geocomposite sheets. The upper tensioning profile is waterproof because we don't want to keep any uh, steel material exposed. So that is also covered so that that is also gets waterproof to 100% level with the PVC geomembrane cover strip water is sealed onto the already laid geocomposite. Then bottom perimeter seal, we did according to uh, what we did in Kadamare, double perimeter seal with a batten strip of 80 by 80 mm thickness behind uh, which the rubber gasket, stainless steel splice place and epoxy was used so that it is kept watertight on the surface. The drained layer placed above the top perimeter seal and between the first and second perimeter seals conveys water to the discharge pipes in the galleries. The drained new geo net having a geotextile on both sides that will prevent clogging of the geotextile. The drainage system allows monitoring and behavior of geocomposite layer. Then we also treated uh, the joints. This is to prevent seepage from the uh, contraction joints. Holes are drilled to reach the copper stops and a polyurethane resin grout is injected into the holes. The end of uh, 2019 works, we had to wind up in uh, September, third, second half, because there was no sign of uh, the monsoon getting over. So we could do only up to 40, five meter stretch with uh, covering an area of uh, 800 square meter. The conclusions are, at Cerular, there were unforeseen constraints in implementing the original schedule ca causing extension of schedule and additional cost. Constraint in depleting the dam due to acute, the problem with the dam is it is not only uh, concerned with the necessity of tangent co, it has to feed water to the downstream. So, particularly in 2016, there was acute water shortage, so dam could be handed over in fully depleted conditions, a social cost. Hence, by the preparatory work got delayed. Uncontrolled and unex unexpected inflow, and whatever the uh, arrangement we made for uh, diverting the water, inflow water that twice it got washed away. The bund has washed away completely during one of the flash floods. So then frequent closure of the Scourun gate for the, according uh, to the demand of the irrigation and thereby the power source run that made the life miserable. Every time we desilt after a couple of days due to the gate closure, the water level will rise and that brings back the, uh, the silt from elsewhere and wherever we we'll remove the silt, that is once again filled back. So this is the problem we have to face. So early again, the last time, the last in that series is the early setting in of monsoon. So that uh, client has decided to impound the water. So this is a sort of situation, non-compliant with as belt drawing, because this, these things we couldn't find in any of the drawings or any of the forecasts. So a challenge, this challenge has become an opportunity to, for us to show that among its multiple assets of geomembrane, water tightness, durability, successful precedents, possibility of monitoring, ease of insulation, etc., the system could adopt, is capable of adopting the unforeseen circumstances also. So DRIP uh, now they floated a second tender using the same uh, 
technology with the geomembrane system for Anathod Dam in Kerala. And uh, we are the, RP is one of the participants in that, and the tender is under process. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, informative example of the use of geomembranes in a project on the trip. We are coming to the last presentation, which will be given by Mr. Sadher Padikal, and he will speak about the sonic tomography study of Chimoni Dam. Thank you, Chair. Namaste to all. Sonic tomography is an advanced method of non-destructive testing to investigate homogeneity and seepage issues in masonry dams. Today, in this paper, I am presenting the sonic tomography study we had conducted for Chimney Dam in Kerala. I have structured this presentation like this. In the first part, I will be explaining Chimney Dam and the problem we had encountered with Chimney which led to a sonic tomography investigation. Second part, I'll be explaining how the sonic tomography settings were done at site. And then I'll be explaining the results, that is the resulting tomograms we got from the tomography study. And finally, the conclusion part, how it helped us inform decision making on the grouting procedure which we are carrying out under the DRIP project. Now, Chimney Dam, which was commissioned in 1996, is built across Chimney River, a small tributary of uh, Karivanno River in Kerala. Uh, this is a masonry dam, random rebel masonry dam. Uh, maximum height of this dam above bed level is about 52.6 meters. And it has a catchment area of 72 square kilometers. And at full reservoir level, the water spread area is about 10.1 square kilometer. Mainly that is meant for irrigation, it's irrigating about 13,000 hectares as the net uh, area. Uh, as you can see in this, Chimney Dam was built Chimney Dam was built uh, in 17 blocks and the overflowing section you can see it's uh, uh, on the blocks 9, 10 and, uh, and 11. And uh, actually this random rebel masonry is given a concrete facing on both the upstream side and downstream side, as you can see in this one. Yeah, on the stream side and downstream side, a cement concrete uh, face has been provided. And the random rebel masonry, it varied at uh, uh, one is to three ratio at the bottom, one is to four just above that, and one is to five as the top portion. And there is a small earth dam, earthen dam portion also, which I am just showing the section of that. And the reservoir has got a storage capacity of 179.39 million meter cube with a dead storage of 6.75. Now coming to the problem, ever since the commissioning of the chimney dam, we were facing extreme seepage. And the seepage was to the tune of 30 liters per second. That is a big issue for Kerala Water Resources Department. And the drainage gallery was very often flooded with water due to choking in the floor drainage hole. This was the main issue that, uh, that led to this uh, uh, sonic tomography. Uh, just to investigate this problem, an expert group was commissioned from IIT Chennai. They visited the site and they had recommended to carry out a sonic tomography to understand the homogeneity and the seepage issues within the dam. Earlier, for the Tungabhadra Dam also in India, sonic tomography was uh, conducted. And now, for this purpose, actually, we had hired the consultancy services of Solgio SRL, an Italian-based uh, company. Uh, this is showing the uh, tomography settings. Actually, in sonic tomography, mechanical longitudinal waves, in short, known as P waves, are transmitted from the upstream side, and they are received on the downstream side. Actually, these uh, P waves are produced uh, either by shocks with a hammer 
or by the shock exciting piezoelectric crystals which are embedded on the upstream side and piezoelectric transducers on the downstream side receive these P waves. This is the arrangement that we have done for the sonic tomography on the southeastern shoulder of the non-overflowing uh, portion that is that is this portion uh, about 10 uh, uh, transversal sections and two longitudinal sections were uh, made and these 10 transversal sections TS1, 2, 3, 4 uh, were on the southeastern shoulder TS5, 6 and 7, they are on the spilling region, that is above the, uh, just below the spillway. TS8, 9 and 10, they are on the other side, that is, that is the uh, northwestern shoulder, uh, that is also overflowing, non-overflowing. And the arrangement was like this, under water actually a sparker has been used, and above water a hammer has been used to transmit the P waves through the dam section and two longitudinal sections were also there, just between the crest and the uh, gallery. This is the arrangement uh, we had done for that. And now I'll be just explaining the tomograph, uh, tomographs that we got. I may not be able to show you all the tomograms, but uh, basically the P waves velocity distribution is getting plotted as tomograms. And when the velocity is below 3000, that is the 3000 meters per second, that is indicative of some issues with the homogeneity or the seepage. Now, I'll just try to zoom this one. Yeah, you can see this uh, bright yellow part. All these are showing a th velocity above 3000. But this pale yellow portion or uh, this region, they are showing uh, a velocity distribution of less than 3000 meters per second. And uh, that, that portion is indicative of the uh, seepage issues within that, that cross section. Now this is for the transversal section number one. And transversal section number two also, uh, you can see uh, same, uh, this thing, uh, pale, pale yellow, almost white region, which are indicative of velocity less than 3000 meters per second, which shows a significant seepage, or which shows uh, significant weakage in the uh, in the section itself, that is homogeneity has been affected. And this is a tomogram for the section number eight, that is also a non-overflowing, almost same results we got, and this is for, uh, uh, this is for number nine, non-overflowing, and this is for the uh, spillway portion. Um, there also you can see just below the spillway shutters, uh, you can see the white patches which are indicating velocity less than 3,000 meters per second, which shows that uh, uh, the dam section has been affected at that particular elevation. Now, by using this uh, velocity and also using the Gardner equation of geophysics, the density distribution is also computed, which you can see in, uh, in this diagram, where you will see uh, this, this slight uh, blue patches. They are all showing low density regions, which are indicative of the uh, seepage in, through the dam. And that is for uh, another uh, spillway section. And this is for the longitudinal uh, section of the dam here. Just below the spillway portion, you can see a uh, low velocity region, which is indicating that the dam structure were, was affected. Now, uh, these are the basic tomograms which we uh, got through this study. And coming to the conclusions, in fact, this tomography has helped us in making an informed decision making on the grouting procedure that we had to adopt under this dam rehabilitation and improvement project. Uh, basically, uh, it was having 30 liters per second seepage in the very beginning, later on which was reduced to 1.7 liters per second. But as of now, we have almost completed the uh, vertical grouting, which was recommended based on this uh, tomography. Right now, we are at 0.75 liters per second is the seepage. So that is a significant reduction in the seepage. Now what we plan to do is that we have almost completed the vertical grouting. In fact, vertical grouting and inclined grouting was recommended due to this, uh, uh, after this tomography study. But uh, we have taken up only the vertical grouting because right now itself it is showing significant improvement. Now what we plan to do is that 
Kerala Engineering Research Institute and the Kerala Water Resource Department has already procured the tomography setup, and we will be doing a post grouting tomography to ascertain how we should go about whether we should take up the inclined grouting or not. This is where we are starting with the tomography study. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you also very much for this very interesting uh, case study on the sonic tomography study of Chimoni Dam. Now also we thank all the presenters that they kept very well the time, so we are really in time. So I think we just wrap up the session and uh, I give, ah, yeah, I heard that we have still some time for some questions, okay. Uh, somebody wants to ask some question to one of these uh, six presentation. Any, que any questions? We still have time for a couple of questions. Seems everybody is, ah, yes, please. Will the other presenters come on stage, please? Uh, if you could get the chairs for them. Uh, this is to Sudhir Padigal on the Chimney Dam. How the excessive sea page is figured out by employing the, seat, the scan tomograph study uh, uh, the, at the downstream and the upstream. How the sea page Excessive seepage is decimated out. Yeah, actually, seepage we are measuring as such in the, in the gallery. And as I said, since the beginning, uh, it was about 30 liters per second. And uh, we have a, uh, this seepage measuring system within the gallery, which we are observing continuously. And using the traditional that notches and these drains inside the gallery, which gives the data of the seepage. And right now, uh, what is recorded is about 0.75 liters per second. But one thing is actually, in this, uh, this, for the past two years, this chimney dam was not filled because of this poor monsoon in this belt. So I'm not very sure about the effect of this because we will be able to emphatically say that this has been fully effective only when the reservoir is getting filled up to the full reservoir level. That situation is there, but nevertheless, it shows a significant improvement. Yes, sure, sir. Uh, whether any uh, any 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 correlation was made with respect to the you know the seismic tomography results vis-à-vis uh, -vis the actual strengths that were there existing in this stream? Because th these are all generally relative kind of results, and and getting the absolute values also is important to know what is the strength of the materials over there. Uh, in fact, the density distribution graph which I was showing. Uh, that's showing about uh, uh, 2.4 to 2.5 gram per cc. So, more or less, uh, that is showing the general uh, compressive strength of uh, concrete dams. But at the same time, some of the patches, when you correlate with that uh, velocity distribution, it shows uh, weakness at the same spots. That is but all we have any, any any holes drilled and uh, in the in the core testing carried out to correlate the results because then only. The rest of the results can be, you know, put on the, on some kind of a Yeah, in basis. fact, it was physically observed, these spots where we could see more seepage, in fact. And even on the downstream phase, we could see the uh, patches where this water was coming out. Because it was a he very heavy seepage for this dam, like 30 liters per second, when it was commissioned means it's a very big thing. So it's not very difficult to understand, because where are the pockets? But again, then to inform the grouting procedure, actually, we had carried out this uh, tomography. It, exactly to know, because IIT experts from Chennai who came there and inspected this dam site, they only recommended that uh, what type of grouting we should go about, because the traditional grouting is just vertical grouting. They had recommended this inclined grouting also. That's what I was trying to make out. Like, uh, we haven't carried out this inclined grouting so far, but we will do a post-grouting uh, tomography again, and we will see what is the result. And accordingly, we will take a decision on that. Thank you, good question. Are there some questions to other presentations? 
By the way, perhaps uh, the presenters can just uh, take a seat on the floor. All speakers are requested to come to the dais. Sir, this is to Sanjay Kundu. Yes, there was a question, please. Uh, uh, sir, this is a question to Sanjay Kundu. Yes, carry on. Uh, sir, you uh, said that legal architecture is very vital element in dam safety. So please elaborate uh, what are the legal uh, issues. I didn't get your question. Can you repeat it? Uh, sir, you said that legal architecture is very vital in dam safety. What are the legal issues involved? See, when we had uh, the number of dams in India was less, probably it was not an issue. But as the number of dams is increasing, it has become an issue. Secondly, as I told you, when the dams were built, they were in remote locations. So there are populations in the vicinity of the dams and downstream of the dams. So if a dam was to fail, it would cause a major disaster. You heard Mr. Ueda extensively, the World Bank uh, Water Resources Chief from Washington. He said the first thing that you need to have is legal institu institutional architecture. Now, we need to see and ensure in government of India and state governments that all our dams are safe. And we need to be able to communicate to the public at large that the huge public funds that have been spent on dams, the dams are safe and the benefits that come from dam are really without any risks. Uh, probably when we, if uh, we had few hundreds of dams, probably would, we would not have uh, needed a law. But now the number of dams is around 6,000 and the number is growing. Secondly, there are a lot of interstate issues also. So on, that, on account of that also, we need a institutional and legal architecture in India to address the issue of dam safety. Yes, please. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll supplement Mr. Kundu. Uh, the issue about the dam safety legislation is to establish a common practice regime across the country. Because what is happening is that when we, when we look at the various individual states or individual units who are maintaining the dams, the capability levels and the processes adopted are non standard. And there has to be a standard so that when we say that a dam is safe, the dam is indeed passing certain minimum qualifying criteria, which is which is kind of set by the law. So that is the and and, and the procedures that are followed are something which are which are of a standard nature. This is the crux of the this dam safety act that we are trying to promulgate. Thank you. Is there another question or some comments? It seems not to be the case. Uh, perhaps everybody is already hungry. Uh, so then uh, I think we will conclude the sessions. Eh? Mm? Thank you. Um, I just uh, asked the co-chairman uh, just to come uh, to, uh, together with me to conclude the session. So uh, we had a very interesting um, presentation on uh, dam safety initiatives. Uh, we had, uh, of course, an uh, excellent overview of what happens and what are the plans and what has been done in India, but also um, we had heard about uh, this uh, dam safety practices in Japan and also in Uganda. And uh, everything was illustrated with uh, three excellent examples. What you will do when you detect some problems somewhere, especially deep underwater, but also to detect, as we heard uh, the last presentation, where happened something, where is the infiltration, where is the weak zones. And then also we heard uh, how we can repair if we have such problems. So I don't know if uh, perhaps the co-chair want to have some additional comments. That's 
Nothing, nothing especially, but uh, just I say it, uh, my saving time is with a more efficient and effective approach uh, uh, will save future, which uh, the, uh, the number of the inhabitants uh, on the world uh, will be the more than uh, 10 billion in 2050, so that we have a responsibility to hand over the good and the quality infrastructure to next generation. Thank you. I'll just uh, add on to what the chair and second co-chair said was, uh, we had three excellent presentations basically on the practices. One was very niche kind of work that Switzerland they are doing underwater. The second is tomography that they did in a dam in Kerala. And third is geomembranes that they are using in Tamil Nadu. I think as the culture of dam safety comes, such techniques and uh, better techniques will come to India. But we had three presentations about the institutional architecture first is japan where they have a modern institutional architecture for dam safety i think uganda is building it up and we are somewhere in the middle but the case in point is that dams anywhere have to be safe and we have to follow the best practices and best institutional architecture okay thank you very much so um we are really happy we were in principle in time because we started a little bit late but every uh, speaker kept very well the time and i think also the presentation were very interesting and i think please give a hand uh, to all presenters and speakers So in that way, uh, we uh, close the session. And of course, I give first uh, the hand for uh, the certificate. May I request the chairman and the reporter for the session to join the speakers for a group photo. A couple of announcements. Those who have not intimated their travel plan so far, please intimate their return travel plan at the travel desk in the lobby of this hall. And the second announcement, a delegate feedback form was circulated. Kindly return it to the student volunteers after filling it. As a token of our respect and appreciation, we would like to present memento to the speakers. May I invite Dr. Anton J. Schliss to present the memento to Sri Elma Kempfen. David Chepto. Shri V. Subramanian. Shri Sudhir Padikel. Shri Hiteshi Sasahara. Shri Sanjay Kundu, Shri T.K. Shivarajan, may request Shri A.B. Pandya, Secretary General, ICRD, and former Chairman, Central Water Commission, to come to the dais and present the memento to Dr. Anton G. Schliss. Thank you. This technical session has come to an end. Let us break for the lunch. We'll meet here by 1.30 for our next technical session on integrated flood management for existing dams. Thank you all. Please take your file also with you. The room is being rearranged.
Dear delegates, a small request, kindly carry your file folders, bags and other belongings with you when you proceed for lunch. As the tables are to be set again, all the delegates are requested to kindly carry their belongings with them. Please do not leave your folders or your bags in the table.